Um, tonight, uh, we get a chance to talk about kind of like the origins of Latino comic, uh, some of the underground artists and, uh, and themes that are prevalent in comic book, comic strip art from a long time ago that a lot of the artists working nowadays have used as an influence and as a theme. Um, because a lot of people, uh, another reason for the Latino Comics Expo is that people are still are not aware that this is kind of like a golden age of Latino comic book creation. Um, when we first did our first expo five years ago at the Cartoon Art Museum, we had about 12 artists at tables showing their work. Um, when we have our expo this year in Los Angeles, we expect to have almost uh, 75 to 80 artists, almost 100 artists in only five years. So there's this tremendous growth and interest in comic book uh, art, comic book images that reflect a more diverse, uh, you know, uh, vision of America and and uh, people surroundings and stuff like that. Um, we consider it to be a very important because uh, visual narrative is something that affects you know, young people so strongly. Um, I forget which psychiatrist or psychologist said that when you're young, there's no limit to the amount of visual images that a young person uh, can create or intake. It's the same thing with languages. There's an infinite amount of images that they can take in. And uh, we kind of see it as our purpose to, to give young people, especially Latino uh, youth, uh, a wide variety of images. Um, to be inspired by. So that's why um, our expo, you know, our, our themes are to try to expose young people to, you know, comic book art. We also see the importance of comics as a bridge to literacy. Uh, a lot of people that do comics, that love comics, that's kind of what started their interest in reading. And um, plus it's fun, so uh, you can't knock comic books. Um, before, uh, I guess when we were young in the 1970s or, or 60s, you know, there weren't very many Latino images in comic books. Uh, you know, everybody remembers Gordo by Gus Ariola, um, you know, some early works maybe that, you know, tios and tias and relatives would bring in from Mexico. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, Disney would do, you know, the Donald Duck in Spanish or something like that, but, you know, very few, um, characters in traditional comic books. Uh, and then, you know, the 60s, 70s came and there was a whole underground comics movement. Other people were, uh, got involved, a lot of them, because they were self-published, independent creators. And you started to see uh, a lot more uh, different voices being able to be heard. Um, and that's where we come in. Um, um, we're gonna talk about those influences um, today. And I'm honored to be able to have kind of an informal discussion, question and answer with uh, probably one of the most important uh, uh, Latino independent, you know, comic book creators that we have. Uh, he definitely was present at a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in the beginning, you know, from the early days of Comic-Con, early days of Bay Area, underground comics. So he knows a lot of the stories, a lot of where the people are buried and stuff like that. So, uh um, and plus, he's, a, he's an amazing artist. If you ever get a chance to see his, uh, his graphic novel series, Tortilla, it's amazing. Uh, kind of like slice of life, uh, remembrances of him growing up as a young Latino youth and the challenges and you know, struggles that he kind of overcame. And plus, we're all awaiting his, his latest work, too. He's been working on a, on a tremendous idea called Turk Street Serenade which kind of uh, traces and, you know, reflects on his life when he was working down in an SRO hotel down on Turk Street in the San Francisco of the 80s. So we know he's got stories. So uh, please welcome up to the stage so we can start our conversation, uh, um, Latino comic book artist Jaime Crespo. Good 
want to touch it. Hola, Jaime. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Excellent. Thank you for having me. No, no. Um, Thank you for the work release. <laughs> <laughs> nice You've done your time. You deserve a chance. That's right. <laughs> Um, let's just talk about, first of all, your, your involvement in, right. in comics. I mean, people always want to start out, how did you get started? You know, what first, you know, got you going in Latino comics? And maybe give us a time frame too, like how old were you? What year did you really first start, you know, doing it? Doing it? <laughs> first, <laughs> watch it. Um, you know, I first started drawing, I guess you could just start, just period. I don't know, I was a little kid, probably about three years old. The running joke in the house was is I uh, had a, my first art show was in the family Bible. I somehow got a hold, yeah, I somehow got a hold of a ballpoint pen. I must have been about three years old. And I guess there was a couple of blank pages of leaf or whatever, and I drew, I don't know, a cat in my dad's car or something like that. Mm. You know, and of course, the reviewers, being my parents, <laughs> the, the show was panned. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so it started probably right around then and has gone unabated since then. Not and, in Bible, so. <laughs> and what about actual comics? Is like, which are the ones, the first ones that you remember that had an impact on you that made you say like, wow, this is... This is cool. This is cool. Sunday Funnies. I remember the funny papers. We moved around. We started in Sacramento and we moved here. We lived in San Francisco for a few years. We in Southern California. And so the Sunday paper, my mom couldn't afford the paper all the time, but sometimes she just get the weekend. So I remember the Nancy, of course, Peanuts was the first ones. Then maybe a few years later, Mad Magazine was, was the beginning, mm -hmm. I think, of where stuff really took off. Speaking of Latino comics, like uh, um, Antonio Projias mm -hmm. with Spy vs. Spy, and Sergio Aragones, you know, the little margin drawings in the margins and stuff. That was pretty, pretty influential. One thing we also noticed, um, especially among younger artists, um, it's been cool to see is just this rebirth in the interest of different Aztec, Mayan themes. You know, that's always been kind of like a standard in the barrio, you know. A lot of people would put it on their low riders, t-shirts, you know, those images have you know, kind of like peeped in popularity lately. Um, my question to you is, did you, were you influenced at all by different Mayan or Aztec images? Oh, certainly. Do you remember seeing them when you were young? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I remember, um, I don't know, it was probably the third or fourth time we were in Mexico, but I was of older age. I was probably seven or eight years old. And my mother is a Yaqui, believe it or not. I look like my dad. And she's from northern Mexico. And some of her family moved to Mexico City. So I remember we went there for the first time. And I can't, you know, this is... You know, I was seven, so that was at least 10 years ago <laughs> that, um, you know, I can't remember exactly where I saw it all. But, yeah, I saw a lot of, uh, you know, calaveras and calacas and stuff in this like little weird little bookstore that was, I don't know what neighborhood in Mexico City. But and I remember just standing there transfixed and they had all these different books. It was some kind of, I guess, something on Azteca culture. And I kind of took that with me and then I'd see stuff, you know. You know, families have certain things, you know, you'd see whatever in, you know, books or somebody's house and, you know, always the calendar. Oh, that's gone. Okay. But <laughs> anyway, that's all right, Sophie. It's okay. Yeah. I, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, it was big time, big time. And then later, yeah. Yeah, you see it on, you know, bajitos and things like that. So. Oh, yeah. Um, another interesting, uh, just kind of like pioneer, early comic book uh, that I had a chance to discover, and I'll be honest about it, it's kind of like a last year. I Believe it or not, we had these comic book creators come all the way from Chile in South America to our Latino Comics Expo. And, you know, we think we know everything about comics, you know, like, yeah, we know Spider-Man, we know Silver Surfer. <laughs> Whatever, and they would come out and they say, "Well, have you heard of El Internato?" Yeah. We're like El Internato, you know, what's that? And it turned out to be this 
amazing comic book. It started like in 1957 in Argentina. And the creepy thing is that it really was like ahead of its time. And like the guy is like time traveler, space traveler. But then part of the time he still lives in Buenos Aires. And, and like the thing he most worried about was like this deadly, like toxic snow that would come down and, and kill people. And, and I just thought it was kind of an interesting point there because it does touch on a lot of stuff that a lot of uh, uh, people are still doing, like uh, science fiction. There's, you know, a lot of what we call Latino futurism, where they're adopting things like from Latin America, like Mexico City, but, you know, in the future, or, or Mayans still around, but very, like, futuristic and, like, spaceships and stuff like that. And um, Kind of like a Blade Runner for yeah, Latinos, yeah. Exactly, yeah, Blade yeah. Runner. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of your work is more kind of a slice of life and kind of, like, mm -hmm. growing up stuff, but I was just going to touch on maybe what science fiction themes kind of, like, do you really admire or kind of maybe influenced your work at all? Blade Runner. <laughs> I go right off the bat. Yeah. I just got the Ford disc set mm. in the mail, too. Um, yeah, I like a lot of sci-fi, though I don't really write a lot of it and rarely draw it, but I've always been fixated with... Francis will tell you. I've always been fixated with um, uh, robots and aliens for some reason. I don't know. It's it's always been kind of a thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's an eternal theme. But I I just thought that it was interesting that you know somebody from Latin America was already touching on these themes. You know, back in the fifties. And uh, yeah, this gentleman too. He has an interesting story because at first his comics were like very very like science fiction. And then as Argentina kind of fell into dictatorship and the whole Juan Perón, you know, junta thing, he started getting a little bit more political. And then, um, believe it or not, once a day, once one day he got arrested, got thrown into some camp and he was never seen again. Wow. Wow. So it was kind of like, you know, another theme in like Latin America, where politics, art, interweave and um just I thought it was very moving that even a comic book artist, you know, was caught up in that. And well, that's been going on anyway, you know, with the Muslims that that shot the people. Sorry. Yeah. So it's you know, but you know, <laughs> yeah, people were you know, cartoonists have already been persecuted and killed in France. You know, the the humor magazine for, and then there was somebody down in Texas. Was it last year? I guess that that uh, had a contest which I found was fuel this woman wanted to incite the Muslim community mm -hmm. by having a cartooning contest. You draw Allah, you know, which is just like, come on, man, it's just disrespectful, flat out, you know, and then those guys showed up and they were killed, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, and these are all, this is just comics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's pretty It, it just reminds me just the power of, like I said, the visual form and, mm -hmm. and just different, ways that comics can reach people and, and the fear that puts into different like governments or sure. regimes and stuff like that but well, comics have been there since the beginning of time when you think about it cavemen and so forth and on and comics along with propaganda and so forth through the ages has been used as a tool you know for teaching for fear for dogma for whatever so it's always been there exactly and for People that are interested in this, I, I heard that this finally got an English translation out. So if you do get a chance to see Internauta, it's a really amazing piece. Kind of predates uh, Moibis and stuff mm -hmm. that Joe Roski was doing, but very interesting. The stuff I have looked through there, it did remind me a little bit of Will Eisner mm -hmm. and the spirit in that kind of sense. So Exactly, because it, 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 there's some like noir little touches mm -hmm. mixed in with like science fiction and stuff. So. Very interesting pioneer. Another big uh, influence for sure is, uh, go back, yeah, go back, uh, is El Santo. Santo. And I have to admit, this is kind of one of the first things, like sometimes, like I said, an uncle would be visiting from Mexico or, or maybe somebody at the swap meet would have these for sale and I would be, oh my God, Santo. Like if my mom would see me trying to buy this, she would be like shocked or something like that. She, she would try to be... <laughs> <laughs> but I would have to like try to sneak it and keep it under my mattress mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Because El Santo, I mean, you would see some crazy stuff in a Santo comic book. Like the early gangster rap in comics. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it was like the first comic where you would actually see like uh, voluptuous women 
like oh i never noticed really yeah <laughs> I, I read it for the article like they'd be, <laughs> they'd be wrestling or fighting vampires or or actually it'd be a voluptuous woman wrestling with a voluptuous vampire or something. right but it was it was art and um the el santo comic book too was like just an early example for a lot of people it, it ran for like 30 years as well so it was a long time comic book that you know hit a couple different generations and that's another thing you see with like early, I mean, with uh, some of the younger comic book creators too. It's wrestling is a huge theme yeah. in our community, even well, even now with on on, on TV, Lucha Vuvum, you know, the whole yeah. the whole wrestling thing. But El Santo is definitely an early pioneer in that, and just the fact that they had El Santo comic book. Yeah, uh, they had the movies. They had the wrestler too, you know, and the you know Lucha Dora. Well, he something. was the king. He was the early king of all media. For yeah, sure. he really was. He 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 covered the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So and just maybe just talk about just like your relationship to wrestling, Latino wrestling. The... I watched both actually. Um, I watched on I can't remember what channel it was, the Spanish language channel, and they would have El Santo and they would show old clips. I remember they always had him on there, and he would talk. They talk about his past and <laughs> you know because I guess that was my generation. He was already towards the end of his. And then where I grew up, they had a thing called Big Time Wrestling, and I used to watch that too with Rocky Johnson and you know Pat Patterson. And I just found out a few years ago. Now this is how ignorant I am. That uh, what's his name? The Rock, uh, Dwayne. Oh, you Jensen. didn't know he was the son. Of yeah, I didn't know he was. He married Peter Mavia's daughter, and or Rocky Johnson did. It. It's all in the Sorry, family. Sorry, I just had it. I had to say that. It's, it's all in the family. I know. thought that was cool, man. That's cool. So yeah, it was. It was an influence. I don't know so much on my cartooning, but just as a rambunctious, hyperactive kid, yeah, you know, my buddies and I would, you know, do stupid stuff and jump off of fences onto each other and break arms and things and you know <laughs> yeah i mean the thing that's interesting to us as an expo is because like i said like maybe our generation we grew up you know seeing stuff like el santo and and seeing stuff like you know the aztec calendar on low riders and stuff like that <laughs> the amazing thing is just how this kind of thing is just exploding like you know now day of the dead is becoming like Oh, it's Cinco mainstream. de Mayo or yeah. St. Patrick's Day. And, yeah. And now even like luchador wrestling is becoming like a huge, you know, you can buy bottle openers with the luchador on it. Yeah, it's the flavor of the month, you know. I hear Filipinos are next. <laughs> I don't know. So maybe we'll have lumpia on T-shirts. I don't know. but In yeah. fact, um, I don't know what your take on this, but I've even read like an essay <coughs> saying that, you know, luchadores are such an important icon in Latino community because it's, that whole thing where like somebody that doesn't reveal their identity has more power, has more strength to like enact change and to to fight crime is is that kind of like the <laughs> Spider Man thing or or do you think that's a Latino thing where we we're able to do more action if we don't reveal our identity? I don't know. I think that's I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think we can do just enough action as we want, showing our identity. <laughs> I oh, mean, but uh, yeah, it, it's again, it, it, it was an influence on me, but a, a small part as again, our generation it was probably more monsters and sci fi mixed with a hot rod culture and lowrider culture and and that kind of thing. Then when I got to be a teenager, I was the first, well, the second actually generation of skateboarding, the Z Boys Dogtown thing. So that also kind of, for me anyway, personally, went into all my, you know, thinking because back then, you know, you were like on the football team, you were a cholo, or you were, you know, there wasn't much, oops, sorry, there wasn't many menu categories as there are now. So, I don't know, skating to me seemed like something free <clears throat> and another form of expression, just like cartooning or painting or writing or music or whatever. And I noticed a lot of the guys I skate with, skated with, I'm still in touch with a lot of them, did become renowned painters, some musicians and so forth, so... I find that, and I nowadays I'm starting to bring up the skating thing. It, it's really amazing to me how I used to get picked on by some of my Latino friends because me and my friend Art Arturo would skate, and it was mostly white kids. And ah, oh, you're doing the wet old thing, oh, white boy, whatever. And now I've traveled half around the world, and I see skaters everywhere of every socioeconomic background, every race, ethnicity, you know, body odor, whatever. <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody's. It, it's it's great, you know that it's become an individual thing. No, exactly. That's, that's mm -hmm. kind of how we feel with, 
you know, the Latino Comics Expo is that, mm -hmm. you know, it shows that we are part of this American culture. It shows that, you know, we'll embrace something like comics and put our own flavor to it and, mm -hmm. and you know, embrace it as well. Um, well, so so, somebody, I got to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Keith Knight, I was on the phone with him recently, and I was telling him, I was, you know, wondering why he missed the Soul Con. And mm -hmm. he said bitterly that he wasn't invited, which shocked me because he's pretty damn well known, you know. <clears throat> and then he was kind of trying to get me into a debate, as he often does with certain mm -hmm. things. Why do we need a Latino and African-American comic con? You know, and, you know, he goes, you're still American, right? And all that. And I go, yeah, so are you. But it's just different tacos. <laughs> That's just the way I put it, you know. And. Hopefully he'll be there this year. Yeah. So I, I told Freddie, you know, get on it. So yeah, that's that's <laughs> always a debate that we get. It's like mm -hmm. we always get people that say, you know, why do you want to separate yourself? Why do you want to, you know, do a convention where it's just Latino comic book creators? You know why? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't consider myself a, a Latino artist. I just consider myself an artist. And uh, it's you know philosophically we kind of come at it like we want to give choices to people. You know, when you go to a restaurant, it doesn't always have to be Chinese. It could be Italian. It can be a taqueria. You know, you, the more choices out there for the public, mm -hmm. you know, the better. Uh, I always tell the story that, you know, the reason we started the expo is because I had two small children. And, you know, every year we would go to Comic-Con. You know, everybody would be lined up, you know, for Twilight or, you know, Hunger Games or something like that. And maybe you would see a Latino artist off to the corner all alone and forgotten, but very talented with something original, with something unique. And, you know, it always bothered me that people weren't at that table, you know. People were at The Walking Dead, and, you know, Walking Dead is fine, but everybody at Walking Dead, it's like... And after years of complaining, you know, a lot of my comic book friends said, well, you know, instead of complaining, why don't you do your own expo? You know, why don't you stop complaining and, you know, try to do something productive with your time. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> so five years later, yeah. you know, here we are. Um, another thing different about our generation is, you know, I'm from the generation, too, that my dad would give me money to buy his cigarettes uh, when I was like eight years old. They would yeah. do that in those days. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, before I would get his, you know, pack of Salem's and stuff like that, I would stop at the comic book spin rack and, you know, look around and start picking my favorites and, I'm just wondering if, if that happened with you as well. Did you have your favorites going to the comic book? Well, I'd send my mom down to get my cigarettes. You know, I'd have to write her a note, which, you know, is pretty bad. No, um, yeah, I would go down to the store and, and spin through the rack and, and see what I wanted. I'm, I, I have to confess, I tried to get into superheroes a couple of times, and I just... Way over my head, man. I just, you know, wow, that's a lot of words. Why is he wearing his underpants on the outside of, you know, what, what does that mean? What is a gamma my mind? You know what I mean? It was just so laborious. And, and I just, so I got left to me by a cousin, a distant cousin, who was going to Vietnam. And he left me all his comics. No, they weren't EC. I only wish. But he left me a bunch of Disney comics and a ton of like, Sad Sack and Casper the Friendly Ghost and Hot Stuff, a lot of the Harvey comics. But all the Disney ones are in Spanish, mm -hmm. and then the other ones are in English. But, I mean, I'm talking, you know. Stacks. I was a little kid, so I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> dang. So I spent a lot of time reading those. And that, I think, also helped me in my drawing style. Because I could draw a bunch of different styles, but I prefer that real cartoony, bendy arm kind of mm -hmm. style. I don't know why. It just appeals to me. But that was a big influence. That guy right there who, who didn't die in Vietnam died much years later. But I, I can almost credit him single-handedly as starting me off to like where I started drawing. I wouldn't copy him, but I'd look at, I don't know, I'd pick up like, oh, how that toaster was drawn. Especially the Disney comics because they were really good at that. Like realistic. And yeah, yeah. Or just, just to get an idea of like putting telephone poles in the background and, you know, mm -hmm. and TV antennas off the houses. These little details, just I liked it, mm -hmm. you know. So. Speaking of little details, that kind of brings us, I don't know if we should call them pioneers, but they definitely, uh, you know, blew, blew up the, the archetype and, and went on a different direction. I remember that they didn't have them on the comic flip racks, but they were kind of more like with the other adult like magazines but i definitely remember the first time i saw love and rockets oh that's later yeah yeah mario jaime and beto yeah. yeah and i was like oh my god they're like you know making comics about my neighborhood or like you know right. people that kind of look like me or 
right. you know, the, the drive low riders and stuff that look at a neighborhood that looks like me. And that was like the first time. And it, it was a very powerful, uh, emotional thing once, you know, I discovered Love and Rockets. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just wondering, you know, when you discovered them and what kind of effect they might have had on you. Oh, pretty much the same. I mean, I was already drawing at the time, but not on the level they were. <clears throat> but when I saw it, it, I think it more reaffirmed mm-hmm. that, yeah, see, see, you know, that we could do this too. And those guys did it. And it was really cool. I mean, it, it opened up a lot more for me. And, and the fact, I mean, I've talked to Mario countless times. Him and I, you know, we were always stuck in my truck going somewhere far. And uh, how that all that really um, opened up also other Latinos to the fact like the skateboarding thing or anything that you don't have to just be this one cookie cutter like enchilada plate number five you know what i mean you don't have to be a cholo you don't have to be a maid you don't have to do this i mean if you like punk rock go be punk rock you want to skate go skate do it as long as you're not hurting anybody you know don't let anybody tell you what to do you know you do it and love and rockets are felt in a small way that cover is awesome by the way is uh (laughs) did that for a lot of people, you know, open a lot of eyes and now, minds. Now, your style is very, like, autobiographical mm-hmm. and, and... And biographical, And too. biographical. <laughs> and you touch on a lot of stuff that happened when you were growing up. Is, mm-hmm. is that something that was maybe sparked by Levin Rockets, or were you doing that already, or...? I was doing it already. I never really thought about, has anybody done this before? Mm-hmm. Might have just been more of an exercise at the very beginning, um, but as time went on, you know, it, it probably was more cathartic, you know, in some ways, just getting stories out. Some were about me. I notice now I'm doing more about my youth. I think it's because of my age now I'm kind of reflecting more, but I tend to, a lot of my stories were, I always use the joke as I was like, like the Chicano Rod Serling in this Twilight Zone. And I'd come up there going, oh, yeah, witness for your approval. <laughs> you know, check out this vato over here that has a heroin problem, you know, <laughs> whatever. And you would follow that, you know, and then I'd kind of step out and let that story go. And that's kind of what that the Turk Street Serenade is all about. It, it's, it'll, it does. I do wind through it as everybody winds through everything. But. Anyway, and then I discovered Harvey P. Carr and said, oh, look at this guy. You know, I love what he does. And Crum was drawing for him and Gary Drum. And so I remember writing to him and he wrote right back to me. Wow. And I sent him some stuff and he says, this is great. You know, and then before I knew within a year, we were having like monthly phone calls, you know, like, hey, because we talk about, you know, three things we love, jazz, comics and books. Sometimes sports would get in there, too. So but uh, yeah, Harvey was a great guy. I owe him a big, big debt of gratitude so he was a good friend and a mentor well now that i think of it since most of your stuff is biographical uh did you ever do stuff that was totally different than what you're doing now i guess is my question did you ever go into different other genres or oh yeah yeah i went through um geez francis you'd know this better than i can't remember anything he's got a big collection of my stuff um i used to do some real well those surreal the el brujo things that were wordless panels Mm -hmm. that were Again, you know, I would kind of touch on on subjects like Mitla and, you know, the four years of the underworld and, and things mm-hmm. like that and, and real but wordless and just just drawing exercises. And, yeah, you know, not saying I did acid or anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> OK, uh, <laughs> oh, let's see. Oh, then our friend uh, Spain Rodriguez, uh, yeah. Bay Area legend as well. <clears throat> and uh, we always tell the story that uh, we were fortunate to have Spain Rodriguez attend our second annual Latino Comics Expo and you know we were totally low budget at that point uh luckily my mom made burritos for everybody so oh, that was they were awesome too that's how we got most of the I artists to show up <laughs> but I remember when we went to Spain and we wanted him to attend because you know we love his work and he was such an influence on everybody uh, we kind of told him well you know we're low budget just starting off expo you know Pura raza, you know, no budget. And he's like, I'm there. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was great. But uh, his work, you know, for those unfamiliar, very, you know, revolutionary. Spain was always trying to, you know, tear down, you know, injustice and, you know, what was not fair in society, flash a light on it and put like, and blow it up for sure, you know. And uh, that's another thing I, I also noticed that was a big influence on, on Latinos doing comics today is just that, 
you know, whole thing against injustice, blowing up, you know, the oppressors and, you know, whether by revolutionary ways or flame throwing and stuff like that. And yeah, you definitely had the whole revolutionary socialist band going. There's a lot of stuff that isn't out there that I saw that he did through with other friends and stuff. And that was definitely his. He's that old line 60s, you know, kind of a Spain Rivera <laughs> exactly. kind of thing. You know? No, the cool thing, too, is I think uh, he also set an example, too, about just not being censored in any way. And not especially like politically correct. Like I think the next panel is probably that was one of his characters right there, you know. And uh, what, what do you mean? <laughs> but uh just that fearlessness you know in terms of of his comics uh you know not being afraid you know taking chances uh, and you know not not censoring himself in any way and you know that's something for sure that i see in your work and you know what's what's your philosophy in terms of censoring yourself or your is there anything you wouldn't do is there things you try not to do or i don't think about it really you know i just just do the story. I mean, the only time I've ever been censored was um, we did a, a of that time. We did I did five years of work. I had displayed at what was the fort oh over by Chrissy Field there. What is it a uh, uh, city? No, nah, but help me out here. What's Fort Mason? Thank you. That's why. That's keep right. Her around. That's why we keep her around. <laughs> She's the brains. So yeah, at Fort Mason, I had a five year retrospective. And in the book Throb, that 24 page, nine panels per page, wordless. Throb, if you're familiar with the book Zoom by Istvan uh, Banyan or whatever, that it zooms, all the drawings zoom into each other. They needed a second book called Rezoom. And I just thought, wow, it's a phenomenal idea. So I did Throb, where you go into the drawing and then you kind of come back out and it's a different drawing and you go down and it goes into a different, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And at one point it goes in and there's, you see a man performing a certain act on a woman anyway. And, and then it goes out and you see it's a guy in a porno bookstore looking at the cover and then it goes out of way. Anyway, <laughs> at the Fort Mason, they said, we would love to hang this, but we can't hang this one particular page, this one panel. And I said, well, then it's 20, three it's supposed to be 24 and i can't do that so the compromise well no first i said just leave it you know and so it was a case of the right hand not when the left hand was doing and they said all right all right we'll leave it so then when i came back for the opening i must have been there like an hour and i'm sitting there having a drink and chatting and somebody points out hey why is there tape over here? one of your your pieces and i'm like what so i walk over and sure enough somebody took some gaffer tape just taped it on the glass right over that one scene so of course I'm immediately going, oh, I'm taking that right off, and and uh, yeah, and that was then there was a big brouhaha. They didn't want kids to come in and get the wrong idea, which I don't know what the wrong idea would be, but you know, I guess that was yeah. I guess talking yeah. about censorship with you, that's so not that was it. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Pretty much though, everything else people just let me run free with it. I don't think I get too radical though. I really don't. I, I don't. Do, do you remember the first time you met Spain and when you saw his work here in San Francisco? Oh was God, yeah. The, for, well, the first time I saw his work was in the seventies in high school or junior high, maybe even. But the first time I met him was like the early eighties in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of dismissed me then, and then uh, then I met him oh, a handful of years later when I was already then in. I was around enough. I was seen enough, and then he then he chat with me. So we were we were acquainted. He was a nice guy though. Yeah. So yeah, the cool thing that I always um, loved about him is that he was influential in like you know Mission Culture Center and Galleria de la Raza in terms of starting the whole mural projects and the mission and stuff like that. He was one of the first ones to yep. really get behind that and him and Mike Rios. Yeah, him and yeah. Mike Rios and yeah. teaching young people how to do that. And yeah, and then you look over to Tommy's joint up there on Van Ness. That's like him. Mm-hmm. Ah, there is the Ron Flat. Yeah. And then we get to Sergio Aragones uh, for the uninitiated uh, Sergio's Living Legend, Mad Magazine. I don't know how to describe all the stuff he does, but. Uh, oh, was it Gru? You turned me on to him. Gru, the. What was it? Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Gru the Wonder. Yeah, I didn't do too well in school, I guess you can see. But you've had a chance to meet Sergio Aragones too at yes, different conventions, yes. do you? Yeah. Nice guy. He's just, he's really. 
just zany and he's like his drawings in a way i mean he's quieter obviously but mm -hmm. he's a very nice man and he's one of the fastest cartoonists i've ever seen and you said as a young person you did kind of uh, see his work in mad magazine and yeah. i had no idea who he was though at that point i mean for years i had no idea he was a latino it was just some dude <laughs> you know just like you know joe schmangi and he's drawing these things on the side that are hilarious right and uh but yeah when i found out i was like yeah <laughs> so a little bit yeah so yeah. yeah no no my funny story is uh one time i i got to moderate a panel that he was on and you know i always try to give like a little gift after the panel so that they'll remember me someday so when i was done interviewing him i gave him uh like a it was a mexican postcard but you know where they have like the mexican poster oh yeah yeah, yeah. of the film yeah and uh he was. He saw it and he got really moved by it. And uh, I didn't know that it, when I guess he's a immigrant from Spain that had to leave during the Spanish Civil War. So he moved to Mexico, right. where his dad opened a film studio, and got to work with like Luis Buñuel and all these other Dolores people. Dolores del Rio, Dolores and, del Rio, yeah. and stuff like that. And, uh, and all I'd my mom's him, favorites. Yeah, yeah, and I'd give him a postcard of a Dolores del Rio movie. And he was like, "Oh my God, my father produced that movie back in the." Oh wow. So wow. he's just an amazing guy, and then he'll he'll tell you stories about how he took mime from Jodorowsky. I guess Jodorowsky was like giving mime classes in Mexico City. And... Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, so he's definitely a, a big pioneer or influence in that because that's that's for sure another theme in Latino <clears throat> comics is humor. Um, you know, we could definitely see it in your work as well, and. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about how important humor has been to you and your work. Oh, vastly important. I, I'm, I feel I'm more of a funnier guy in person than what I draw. So it kind of balances out. But yeah, I know some of the Latino culture is uh, I'll use humor sometimes in really, I guess for lack of a better term, more down situations or things that are a little more serious. But I try to flip humor in there. <clears throat> and at least through my family and other Latino families, I notice that is kind of a trend too, is, you know, a little bit of dark humor. Here and there goes a long way, mm -hmm. but I think humor is vastly important. But it's just as important as is pathos and anything else. Well, I was I always go back to the the story you did about uh, your troubles with math as a oh, young person. Good and it's Lord, like, yeah. Uh, if you guys get a chance to to get that issue of uh, it's in tortilla, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's in um, the last tortilla, <clears throat> number three. I'm almost done with number four, actually. But it's an incredible story of uh, Jaime and his troubles with math, but. Uh, it's like at one turn heartbreaking, but at the other turn hilarious. And yeah. Well, because I'm pointing out the, the absurdity of, you know, the situation where I didn't know math. And I was, I was kept after school in junior high every day for a school year. And, you know, I still didn't know math. I don't know wh whose wisdom was like, oh, I know. We'll keep him after school for an hour every day in this room. And, you know, I know be Einstein by the end of the year, you know. But I just read a lot of comics and drew a lot. So... <laughs> read the paper you know so i got a lot of reading done <laughs> and then of course we get to uh low rider magazine um i always you consider it a huge influence because i i grew up in east la during the 70s and i always tell people that was kind of like a, a golden age just for chicanos and latinos it, I think it was the last year that there was, the last decade, there was a lot of government programs, you know, mm -hmm. to do murals, to get, you know, after school jobs and cruising. Cruising, too. Way to your boulevard, man. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Those were like the golden ages. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember Lowrider was a big influencer, just uh, the art that they showed in their pages, the Lowrider magazines. I mean, a lot of this stuff has become ubiquitous. I mean, on t shirts, on art, and stuff like that. But it, I remember it first kind of showed itself uh, in the, in the pages of you know Lowrider magazine and a lot of these you know iconic images and calacas you know Latino women and stuff like that and and was Lowrider magazine an influence on you? Do you remember? Yeah, you know, when you first enormous. I was in car clubs. I had a couple mm -hmm. cars myself. High school had a '68 Riviera two door, slammed all the way down. And in those days, kids. They didn't have the independent hydraulics. We just had the front and the booty. That was it. <laughs> and then uh, I did my own primer gray. I was going to make a midnight blue. I actually found in a trucker magazine the lights you have, like you see semis on the freeway, and I have all the different lights, and some guys get carried away. I found blue lights. I bought two blue <laughs> lights, mounted them under my front wheel well with a switch. So when I hit the juice in the front, I'd flip those on. This blue light would come down. 
<laughs> firme, firme. <laughs> que suave. Yeah, it was... Um, yeah, and then I sold my friend Miguel. He painted it midnight blue, T-top the roof. And I heard a month later, he was bullfrogging it at the Winchell's Donuts where everybody did it, and he bent the frame. Not my monkey, not my circus. So I said, dude, I got my money. So... Oh yeah, and now we come, um, and like I said, uh, now we come to our Latino Comics Expo artists. Um, some of them who are here today. Some of them are felons. I so, <laughs> <laughs> indicted, not convicted, um, because like I said, it, it, it seemed like a lot of these themes it, they have you know come and influenced the artists of today. Like I said, some of the there's a lot of science fiction. There's a lot of Mayan, Aztec themes. You know, humor for sure. Um, and some of that work is reflected in, in the artists that uh, participate in the expo. Um, if you guys get a chance to read my partner, he's the co-founder of the Latino Comics Expo, um, Aviar Hernandez. His main character is El Muerto, mm -hmm. and he kind of symbolizes, uh, even though he's been doing this character now for like about 15... Longer than that, probably maybe 20, 20 years. 20 yeah. years now. So he's always mad when people say oh you just started this because of day of the dead it's like no he was been doing that <laughs> he also started the twerking trend too, so. <laughs> but in muerto he's known as the aztec zombie uh, he only awakes once a year on day of the dead to help his loved ones and families and whatever crisis and challenges may occur uh, it was turned into a feature film starring wilmer valderrama Check it out on Netflix. <laughs> or you could come to our first ever Latino Comics Expo fundraiser, mm -hmm. which will be on June 22nd at the new uh, Mission Alamo Draft House Cinema. Oh, yeah. Check yeah. out our website, latinocomicsexpo.com. It'll be a rare big screening uh, of El Muerto. Uh, some of the other work, too. Rodi Montijo. That guy. He's incredibly talented. Um, He's an alien, man. That guy is just way too good. He just recently returned from Japan where they were, he was turning in uh, his one of his creations, Halloween Kid, into an animated feature as well. So Pablo's Inferno is his, is his main character as well. I love that one. Uh, El Sonambulo is, is amazing work by Rafael Navarro <laughs> from the comics hotbed of Whittier. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but El Sonambulo is also kind of envelops a lot of the themes that have been past and present. You know, wrestler. He's a wrestler uh, by day, f you know, film noir detective by night. night so yeah. he solves crimes, but he knows all the chokeholds as well. He does. Yes, he does. Yeah. Eight elbows of death. And Rafa's badass, man. That guy's just Rafa's the Incredibly man. Incredibly talented. Yeah. Um, one of the things we're proud of as well is that almost half of the the artists that participate are, are Latinas as well. We've, we've seen this huge explosion in terms of Latina comic book artists uh, doing their own things. Uh, I do notice that you know a lot of them do science fiction and, and crazy stuff, but uh, a lot of them also do uh, slice of life, uh, family oriented uh, themes like that. Liz Mayorga is, is mm -hmm. she's great at that. It, you know she can sum up a a family vacation in Mexico and mm -hmm. all the underlying themes and but then go to a story about werewolves and then go to a story yeah. about werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, this guy, I don't know, man. It's... This artist, uh, I'm proud to say, is in our audience today. Let's give a hand to Daniel Parada. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, I'm I'm proud to say, was at our first Latino Comics Expo, and I always we always like to take credit that we inspired him. <laughs> Uh, to do his amazing comic book series, Zots, um, where he kind of basically reshapes, reconfigures the whole Mayan history, um, culture. And I mean, the amount of research that he does, the, the authenticity that he brings to costumes, weapons, you know, storylines, it's amazing uh, what he's been able to do with his series. I mean, it gets deeper, and more complex as it goes on. I, I won't put pressure on him. I know he's working on book three. We're hoping that it'll be ready by Latino Comics Expo in August. And what uh, did you describe his book as once? Because I use it all the time when people Well, he ask gets me. mad, but I say it's kind of like uh, the mind Game of Thrones, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot better than that. Yeah, but imagine <laughs> if the Spanish like never arrived. 
like they just came up on the shore and just said keep moving <laughs> you know and and it just ended up i think it's excellent yeah because he really goes into like what happens with all the mayan empires and tribes and the battles and the families and it's 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 rich it's dense it's you know it's mm -hmm. it's authentic it's it's one of the crowning achievements right now i think in the golden age of latino comics and Rico and I being his biggest influence is, uh, I think, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Crystal Gonzalez is another amazing yeah. Latina. And we always bust her out when we show that we, we do have diversity in Latino comics because she is, uh, we like to joke because she's like a real quiet, you know, self-effacing mm -hmm. um, young lady. But her art is just so wild and surrealistic and... Uh, if you, you can tell, yeah. you can tell by the photos, she's... Her, her art will cut a bitch. It will. <laughs> it just, it will. She's amazing. She's cool, too. And, uh, yeah, Latino Comics Expo. We, we kind of, you know, we pitch ourselves as the online, you know, content platform for the 21st century. If you're interested in, you know, comic book hero stories, themes that are totally outside of the mainstream, that are totally different than you know where your spot you know uh, we always try to do interesting events all over like i said june 22nd we'll be at the alamo draft house uh, we'll show we'll be showing some animated shorts and and uh, different fun stuff and then our big latino comics expo convention will be uh, down in southern california at long beach right this, yeah, yeah long beach near the queen mary mm. august 6th and 7th uh, and this will be our biggest best one yet so uh, please make plans to be there if you haven't already. Um, once again, we'd like to thank everybody for coming, the San Francisco Public Library. This is kind of your, your chance right now to ask any questions or, or comments uh, about Latino comics. Like I said, Crespo's quite an authority. He's been there pretty, since the beginning. I always tell people that Mario Hernandez, are, are, he's kind of like our fairy godfather of the Latino Comics Expo. Because <laughs> uh, he always tells us, like, you know, oh, I yeah. was there at the early days of Comic Con, yeah. and you guys are much better organized, and yeah. you know, you guys are doing it much more legit than they did in the beginning. So I was there when Walt Disney first decided to. Yeah, draw. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Jaime, you've been there in the beginning as well. How I was there again early? It was, it was like, I don't know, like a giant hall. <laughs> you know, it looked like just. I don't know. It's it's. I guess like if you ever been to the San Francisco Zine Fest, kind of like put that in half, and it was about like that. The, the early like the first twenty years, fifteen twenty years of the Comic Con, mm -hmm. and now it's like forget about it. You can't even get in, you know. And and it's all about movies and <laughs> everything else. So so in comparison, how would you compare the Latino Comics Expo in our first five years? Because We've been very fortunate that Jaime has been there since the beginning as well. And, and they don't make me clean up afterwards anymore, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. No, it's uh, it's great, man. It's just getting bigger, better, and more organized. It's it's really nice. And I like the diversity we're having coming in. It's 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 quite encompassing now. And it's only going to get bigger. You can just see it. Mm -hmm. I can't believe 75. It feels like it was the other one. The first one was just last year. It feels like it was just a few of us, you know. Yeah. And... Uh, the Latino Comics Expo, like I said, is it's it's not an attempt to separate or anything like that. It's just to bring different perspective, give other artists a, an opportunity um, to show their work, and and like I said, in a way, it's also an opportunity to us to show that you know we are part of this American fabric, and and something as American as, as comic books is something that's important to us as a people, and something that we actively uh, participated in as well. So. Like I said, if anybody has a question or comment, this is your chance, this is your time. Um, anybody have a comment or question? Yes, sir. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And I, I 
<clears throat> oh, ISIS. I go way back with her. Yes, yeah, she well, is. She's down in Oaxaca, though. Yeah. She's in San Miguel de Allende. Yeah. yeah and we were proud went. that she she tabled at our yeah. Latino Comics Expo. She's a friend of the expo. Yeah. I did she a couple. She had my mom's burritos. Yeah. I had her at a couple art shows I had, too. Her and I did together. And she's amazing. She's yeah. amazing. And then uh, growing up in Sacramento, I was fortunate to hang out with a lot with uh, Jose Montoya. And went to high school with a couple of his sons, Mal and Vince, are good friends, and Richard, the the actor. So I know them guys. And uh, yeah, the Royal Chicano Air Force. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. You mean that aren't like buffing the the, the lobbies or? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's Yeah, that's that's another thing we're proud of the expo is that you know like a comic con it's so crowded, it's, you know you're lucky if you get an autograph or something like that, but Latino Comics Expo is still a spot where you can come and talk to an artist mm. cuz we've actually had an artist from Pixar, Octavio Rodriguez. Oh yeah. He's working on the big Coco, the Day of the Dead movie that Pixar is trying to trying to put out later on this year, next year? Next I don't year. Know. Just but. don't ask Lalo about it. <laughs> <laughs> so we do, it is a good chance for a young artist to mentor with other artists and ask questions. And we've had other artists that work for like Warner Brothers and and stuff like that. So it's... Well, Rafa, didn't he work for? Yeah, Rafael works for somebody. Um, the Traveling Thornberries, or which one was the one he worked on? He worked for Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon, yeah. Oh, Rugrats. That's right, that's yeah. right, yeah. So, it, you know, it's an opportunity for, like, people to come to the expo. They can talk to us, like, hey, how'd you wind up at Pixar? Or, hey, how'd you wind up, you know, doing mm. animation? So that's another thing we pride ourselves. Uh, that and that um, our panels, too. We have incredible panels and workshops. Kids, you know, get a chance to work with artists. And, and our panels are just amazing. I mean, we have... Like one year we had all three Love and Rockets brothers, which is very rare. Not even Comic Con does that. We had Jaime, <laughs> Gilbert, and Mario, the whole yeah. trifecta. I heard they didn't fight once. No, they actually they sent me notes like, thank you for getting our family back together. Yeah. Mm. Um, this year, Jaime Hernandez, you know, will be at our expo again mm -hmm. this year. He's considered the, probably, I don't know, the, the top, you know, Latino cartoonist. You know, yeah, he, he's the Groucho. Of the uh, <laughs> Hernandez brothers, where Mario always feels like Zeppo. <laughs> for those here that get that, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, for example, we've been praying ourselves the last five years. We always have like a, a Latina power um, panel mm -hmm. where they talk about the issues and the concerns and their challenges. And, um, you know, they, you know, so it's kind of a nice, it's a, it's a convention, but it's also a chance where people can get together and talk about, you know, what. You know what? What are the major concerns? How can we improve? How can we get our art out there? Because it's an exciting time. Like I told you, like we know that the culture is just, you know, saturated with like Spider-Man, X-Men, you know, da 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 da, da Captain America, which we all love, you know. Um, but people forget that these characters have been around like fifty or sixty years. You know, it's, you know, the dads are sharing it with their kids, and it's just becoming saturated. So. A lot of these Latino images, we tell people, this is your chance to get in on the ground floor, you know. 30 or 40 years from now, when all the movies or a lot of the movies are going to be Latino characters and based on Jaime's comic books, you could say that you were there at the, be right. at the beginning of the Latino Comics Expo explosion. So, And all, all kidding aside, though, about the, the Latino Comics Expo, one thing I, I have found is that we f I feel like we're family. I mean, like all the other cons, I mean, the, you know, Zine Fest, I have like my, my friends there, you know, but I occasionally meet somebody new, but this has become mm -hmm. like, we're like a big amoeba that just rolls around, you know, and we're all like got each other's back and hey, how you doing? How's your, you know, oh, here comes Carlos, hide the beer, you know, kind of everybody. It's it's really nice. I really like that. There's a lot of support and, and it feels it's like a, a family. It's important. A lot of artists, you know, they work, you know, by themselves in their room and their mm -hmm. drawing table. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of good, nice to get that community support, that um, just other artists support that know that, hey, I'm not in a vacuum. I'm not right. by myself. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's another important, you know, function of the Latino Comics mm -hmm. Expo. Enjoy that. Yes, sir. Seen that 
translated into English. Um, mm. so we, I mean, is, there, is, is there some reason for that? Or, or is there, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's so famous in Mexico. Yeah. Well, you'll see it up here. I've seen it around, but through friends, I guess. You know what? The one thing I have heard is because, you know, uh, just to drop some insider knowledge, uh, <laughs> our friend Rafael Navarro, who does El Sonambulo, mm -hmm. he's been working on uh, an amazing version of El Santo in animated form to modernize it for young audiences here in America or even on Telemundo or Univision if they would do it. But, you know, there's something weird about the rights to stuff in Mexico, like, you know, it's it's owned differently or stuff like that. So it's very hard to get stuff that has copyright in Mexico. And very few things have copyright in Mexico. Oh, man, yeah. But when it does, it's <laughs> like, it's very hard to, to get it over into the U.S. market. Yeah. Like, that's why you haven't seen uh, El Santo or a Mil Mascaras or something that would be big among the kids, you know, today here in the U.S. You, you would think it'd be a natural. So that right. that's my only idea on that that it's hard because you're right it's more like us trying to get the copyright from there because you know, go to mexico you'll see a million ceramic bart simpsons you know for sale you know our people they see some ah that's going to be a pinata i mean you know they already had the donald trump pinata a couple years ago you, you know there's but it's, no yeah, shame i do notice it's <laughs> kind of harder coming that way here you know so. yeah it's the flip there. yeah although i guess maybe macho is not politically correct anymore no is it now <laughs> masculine i don't know affirmative i don't know <laughs> my, my daughter says it represents the the ruling patriarchy so yeah okay there you go and speaking of my daughter i'd like to give a big shout out to sophie who did a wonderful job on the powerpoint thank you so she's an official staff member of latino comics expo <laughs> you'll find her on linkedin <laughs> anything else Thank you once again. Like I said, uh, latinocomicsexpo.com. Like us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. June 22nd is our fundraiser at the Alamo Draft House. And um, August 6th and 7th in Long Beach, if you're there. And once again, I'd like to thank Jaime Crespo. Please support him. Put, put pressure on him to finish his latest. I'm finishing. Doing, doing a web page again, a website. So I was just on KPFA, and I was really embarrassed to say that a uh, no, nah, I don't have a website anymore. I kind of let that one go. So right now, this week, we're putting one together. So you could see what kind of absurd life I live. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah, I have a radio show at another station. I work at a station in West Marin, KWMR. I'm just one of the office monkeys there. But I have two shows, or I have a music show. I'm on Wednesday evenings now at 6.30 to 8.30 and it's random music randomly. Then every other Saturday, I do a, a sports show with this guy, Steve S. And it's sports, but it's not baseball, football, and basketball. We just covered the uh, National uh, Lawnmower Championships. There's underwater hockey in Colorado. I kid you not. Um, so we're doing competitive eating and all, all the important sports. So every other Saturday on KWMR. Thank you for your time, hermano. Appreciate it. What Ali? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Sound like Godzilla. <laughs> Hungry? No. I know. Oh man. <laughs>